Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm also delighted that my previous speaker was Emily because my daughter loves cat shoes. Okay. <laughs> So uh, when I go back today and tell her that I was on the same podium as the big boss of KEDS, she's going to finally think I'm doing something meaningful. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm here to talk about uh, you know, AI, mobile, and blockchain. Um, now, these might not seem like something that fits in naturally, but I'm going to try and make the case it does. Uh, this is also the topic of my book. There's my plug right away. Uh, it's called Tap Unlocking the Mobile Economy. It's also been translated into Korean and Chinese. So if you have friends over there, please spread the word. <clears throat> so um, let's have the basics, right? So you know, many of you are practitioners, and you know, what we've been doing is essentially, as firms, you identify the known needs of your customers. Okay? So we've, we've been on this battleground for the last several decades, and you know, many success stories out there. But what I'm going to argue is that the next battleground is actually going to be in identifying the unknown needs of the customers. Okay? And that's where the confluence of AI, mobile, and blockchain is going to be remarkably useful. And hopefully, I'll convince you with some of the examples based on the work that we've done over the last few years. Okay? So let's start with the you know, summary of the world today. If you look at companies, um, so I've been studying you know, the kind of investments that brands have been making in the mobile space for the past decade or so, ever since the first smartphone came out in 2007. And by almost any definition, it's clear to me that most companies are under-investing in mobile. Right? So I can you know, give you a number of different KPIs, but one of the most compelling ones is if you compare the time people are spending on their smartphones versus the ratio of ad dollars being spent on smartphones as a function of ad dollars being spent on print, uh, you know, TV, internet, radio, there's at least a 7 to 10% gap there, which in the US alone works out to be about $16 billion in potential monetization. That's not yet been done. And if you take the next five countries by mobile spending, which is basically China, South Korea, India, Brazil, and Germany, that very quickly translates into hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay? Now, why so? You know, having an, uh, investigated the reasons, there's two main reasons. Uh, you know, one is, well, you know, data. So some companies or some brands will say, we don't have the right data yet. Um, or even if you have the data, maybe you don't have the right resources. And I think that's going to change. It's going to change not just because uh, you know, the two main platform companies, Facebook and Google, have the kind of data that you need. But the new kids on the block are your old uh, friendly neighborhood telecom providers. So uh, I have looked at data from both Facebook and Google, and that's fantastic. But even better data, the kind of data that I'm talking about exists with the likes of Verizon or AT&T and, and similar telecom providers elsewhere. Okay? So um, there's a reason why Verizon ended up buying Yahoo and AOL and formed this new company called Oath. Um, they are going to give uh, the duopoly you know, a non-trivial run for their money. Okay? The other reason is sometimes many companies would use the wrong metrics. Um, so I'm sure some of you have heard of attribution analysis, right? So quick show of hands. Right, so, great. So basically what this means is trying to figure out the ROI of your digital investments. And quite often, astonishing as it might seem, I've come across conversations in senior leadership where people will say, well, you know, mobile only accounts for 4% of our conversions, so why should we invest in mobile? Okay? Um, and that's really the problem, because you're not gonna, you should not be looking at conversions or the last touch point as, as a, the most important metric, you should follow the entire path to purchase, right? And so uh, the first speaker, Bridget, talked about this, you know, this pretty uh, convoluted path to purchase. And you'll see that for many brands, mobile fits right there in the middle or at the beginning. So if you're only looking at the last touch point, that's not the right metric. We've investigated this sort of attribution analysis across both online and offline. It turns out that mobile can be as much as 35 to 40% of uh, all your transactions if you look at the, the source of influence. Okay? Um, consumers, uh, turns out that you know, we're all doing everything everywhere. What that does it mean? What that means is location data, which was the big promise of mobile, is really not as useful as it should have been. Okay? So 61% of millennials, for example, and 50% of Gen X, Gen Z rather, are shopping for products while they're in their bed. Uh, the same number corresponds to about uh, when they're shopping for products in their, in their car, hopefully they're not driving, it's an Uber or taxi, that's about 31%. Okay? So everybody's doing everything everywhere. So location, pure location-based targeting doesn't address fundamental shifts in consumer behavior. Okay? So what I'm gonna argue is that there are other forces out there 
that you can actually add on top of location data to make this a lot more meaningful and enriching. So the three topics for my talk today is, you know, what are the other forces that we can actually add to location data to make this a lot more powerful uh, and more meaningful? Um, what are some examples of machine learning or AI that brands and companies can use? Again, based on examples that we've already undertaken, so it's not futuristic entirely. We have evidence that this actually works. And finally, I've heard a little bit upon some of the addressing the pain points and where blockchain can potentially play an important role. All right, so let's start with, you know, what is fundamentally different about mobile, right, as a device? It's portable and it's personal. Right? It's always with you, and it typically only belongs to you. You may share your laptop, your desktop, but you're not going to share your smartphone with even somebody in your family. Okay? So what that does, it, it generates very atomic user level and very fine-grained behavioral data about the, about the consumer. Okay? Um, and this data that I'm going to talk to you about is multi-layered. It's not just you know, location. Location is fundamentally important, but like I said before, it's not as useful as one would have thought. Okay? Uh, this data comes out of a multiple interfaces, so either you are sending text messages or you're on the mobile web or you're browsing on the mobile app or you're watching videos. It's rich media, multimedia, unstructured and structured. Um, I'm going to walk you through examples of the work that we've done across the world. So we've got some examples from the US, of course, but of course, uh, China, South Korea, Germany, uh, and so on. And then um, I won't be able to get into the details, but all of the methods that we've used will rely on some or other form of AI, okay? Whether it's machine learning or deep learning or um, you know, randomized field experiments combined with machine learning or statistical modeling. Uh, and you'll see that sometimes these methods are useful in uncovering these insights that we can use, okay? Okay, so um, let's start with the talk about the discussion of the forces, right? So I said it's mobile, it's portable, and it's personal. That means the data that's coming out is precise and it's very, very unique. Uh, you know, the latest smartphones from the likes of Samsung or Apple can identify our locations with 91% accuracy within three feet, okay? which totally changes the definition of what location really is. Okay? But like I said, location is not enough. The good news, though, is there are eight other forces that you can tap into. Okay? And these would be, you know, starting with context. So context is really important because, you know, context obviously means different things to different consumers. And I'm going to give some examples where you see that when you combine location with time, both of which are available to brands now, you get a richer insight into context. Okay? You're walking down Madison Avenue in New York City. It's 2 p.m. on Tuesday. You know, Starbucks sends you an offer and your favorite pop sends you an offer. And you look at what redemptions are like at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday on a working day. And the same idea, but you switch the time, keep the location the same, keep the person the same, switch the time from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., and suddenly the Starbucks redemption is going down and the pub redemptions are going up. Okay? What else do you know from location? You get an insight into how crowded the context is. And it turns out that you know, social psychologists have predicted for decades that our behavior changes fundamentally when it comes to uh, the impact of crowdedness. And you will see some studies that I'll show you where crowdedness, in fact, uh, influences consumer purchases in a somewhat surprising and a fairly non-intuitive way. We also know from your location the real-time weather. And what we've also done are experiments where by changing elements of the creative or elements of the pricing or the targeting strategy based on weather, we get some uh, massive redemptions uh, for the offers. Okay? So there are these nine forces that I talked about in my book. I won't get a chance to go through all of them, but I'll give you examples of two or three uh, to give you a sense for how these nine forces are shaping this economy. This economy today is worth $3 trillion, but yet it's only 4% of the world's GDP. Okay? So 4% of the world's GDP is all that's touched by mobile today. That translates into $3, $3 trillion. It's only going to grow you know, exponentially from here. Okay, so you know, as marketers or as data scientists, you know, one thing we always look for is consumer behavior. And um, what we have seen over the last decade or so investigating this phenomenon, there's some surprising and interesting contradictions, behavioral contradictions. Okay? For example, the um, vast majority of consumers who we studied would say we really claim that they claim to be spontaneous, we're very impulsive, we're not planned. And yet, when we look at their actual behavior, their data, it turns out they're a lot more predictable. So there's a contradiction right there. Uh, consumers will say we find ads annoying, you know, they're intrusive, they're overwhelming, they're um, too much information right there, but they also have a fear of missing out, okay? 
And so while explicitly they may get turned off by ads, there's an implicit bias of, uh, for in, in favor because ads can actually inform them of what's the latest and the greatest around them. So the fear of missing out gets alleviated through ads. Consumers will say we create choices, but when you give them too many choices, there's also an information overload problem. There's a choice paradox problem. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, one of the earliest instances of this was studied by uh, Shin Iyengar, who's a professor at Columbia University. Yeah? But we see more and more evidence of this in the mobile space. And lastly, and most interesting perhaps, is that consumers will say they claim to care about the privacy of the data, but what we keep, keep seeing consistently is that we are willing to extend that data in return for some benefits, either convenience or economic benefits, and so on and so forth. Okay? And so uh, the last point is remarkably consistent across uh, you know, the millennials and Gen, gen um, Zs. That's 25% of your workforce. They have $2 trillion in market power, and there are 140 million such people in the US. So it's, you know, as marketers, it's important for us to seize these opportunities to see that, OK, if people are saying one thing and they're doing something else, there's an opportunity for us to uh, tap into that. So let's start with one example of context, right? So what do I mean by context? What I mean is, you know, we all have multiple avatars, right? So these avatars are shaped by the modes and our moods. Um, why are we here? What are we thinking right now? Um, how did we arrive at a certain decision-making process? Turns out that the data that is generated from your smartphone gives us very crucial insights into these questions, the why, the what, and the how. So I'll give an example of this. Um, you know, this is a picture of a cruise liner. Cruise liners are very similar to hotels, right? So they get people from multiple nationalities, except there's one big difference there. So if you're the chef in a hotel and you run out of an ingredient, you can run to the nearest grocery store and get that restocked. You can't do that in a cruise liner, okay? So preventing stockouts and inventory planning is remarkably crucial in a cruise liner, which is why cruise liners are some of the heaviest users of analytics. And we often get, don't get to hear about this. But if you look into the investments they have made in machine learning and AI, it's uh, fascinating. Okay? So here's an example of the work that we did. I, now I'll take you to uh, Asia. So this is the city of Seoul. Uh, you probably might recognize there if, uh, the Han River if you've been there. So here is some consumer, John Doe. Right? So John Doe leaves home. And the, from home, he goes to the workplace. From workplace, maybe he goes to a client call, and then he comes back home, okay? So this is John Doe's typical commuting trajectory. This is what he does from Monday to Thursday, okay? So another day, maybe a Friday or a Saturday, the same John Doe leaves home. Uh, he goes to the workplace, makes another same similar client call, but instead of coming back home right away, he goes to a fourth spot, he goes to a fifth spot, and then he comes back home, okay? So on certain days, the same John Doe is not a commuter. So one of the questions we looked at here was, when is a better time for a brand to reach out to a person? When he or she is commuting or when they're in a non-commuting mode? Okay? Second question is, how many such offers or messages should you reach out with? Right? You don't want to annoy them, but you also want to trigger some interest. So what's the right optimal number of messaging? Is it one or is it three? Is it five? So what we found, for example, in this was we worked with a wide variety of brands from you know, retail, apparel, uh, cosmetics, banking products, fast foods, salons, and so on, that commuters, all is equal, are always more likely to redeem an offer than a non-commuter. Okay? So people, if you're able to target them with the right offer, we find that when the days when they're commuting, uh, it's a much better uh, probability for you to get a redemption from them. However, that being said, the optimal number for commuters is actually one. Okay? Uh, in fact, more than one message and VC redemption is going down. The converse is true for non-commuters. For non-commuters, the optimal number of messages in terms of an uh, offer or an ad is in fact three. Okay? So we started investigating you know, why these things happen, and it turns out it's often explained by the fact that non-commuters have more time, they are less constrained for time, so they have more opportunities for exploring. Okay? Whereas commuters actually prefer something that, uh, you know, the, where a brand actually knows exactly what they want, when they want, at the right time, right place, and so send me an offer that actually resonates uh, with them. Okay? So um, the two things that we learned from this was it's really important to build trust, and the way to build trust is to get to know your consumer, you know, get to know the usuals, for example. You know, if your barista in your coffee store knows exactly what you like, that makes you feel special. It's okay? so the same idea. 
with uh, a number of different brands. But the other thing is more than trust, what is more important perhaps is receptivity, which is figuring out you know, what is the right frequency of messaging and what's the right relevancy of this messaging. Okay? So that's where we start to see those uh, inverted u shipping curve, right? So for the vast majority of people, anywhere between four to six exposures is optimal. That's what triggers the maximum probability of purchase. Below four, it's too few exposures. They're not, it's not triggering their curiosity. And above six, it's too annoying, it's too overwhelming. Okay. All right, here's another example where we leverage uh, potential synergies between mobile and outdoor overhead billboards, right? So this is a scene from Shibuya crossing in Tokyo. So if you've been there, you, you know, it's like a million people crossing there every single day. So here's a, a you know, well-known uh, space for um, very valuable real estate for outdoor billboard ads. So you see all these screens over there, they have LED screens, so the ads keep changing every three minutes, okay? So imagine if uh, Apple, and there's an Apple store right there, Apple brings out a full page, uh, you know, three minute ad for the new iPhone X. And then Apple, in collaboration with either a platform company or a telecom provider, is able to randomly target 10,000 of those people who pass through Shibuya Crossing on a single day. Okay? And so the way this experiment unfolded was a random sample of 10,000 people who are crossing Shibuya on Friday afternoon get exposed to the Apple ad for the iPhone X. And then around the same time, okay, or shortly before that in fact, we send them a targeted offer, uh, either in the form of a text message or through the Apple app that says, uh, you know, welcome Anindo, for you today, anything in the Apple product category is at 20% discount. Okay? So what we leveraged there was an outdoor offline exposure to an ad for a product combined with a very targeted offer that could be compelling to the consumer. Okay? And what we saw was redemptions went up 400%. Okay? So there is a non-trivial synergy between the simultaneous exposure between when people are getting an offer and they're also getting to see the ad, 49% uh, of them bought the uh, whatever product they had to buy within the same day. Um, the other 51% ended up buying uh, within the week or so. Yeah. And so the average redemption with mobile was about 1.5 to 2%, and in this experiment, that number uh, increased to double digits. So we're getting close to 10% redemption rates. Here's another example. This is work in Europe. Uh, fairly large project. We had you know, 3,500 different firms of you know, over 374 cities. And what we looked here was a very simple question. Right? So imagine you have an app. When you open the app, you get to see the different offers from different brands. But in this case, the brands also reveal how far they are from you, the distance between the user and the store. Okay? So again, take the coffee example. You know, if Starbucks is sensing that um, you know, my friend, Professor Jivong, is 100 meters away, and my other friend, Professor Dar, is 50 meters away. Why send them both the same offer? Wouldn't it be more economically rational if you send a lower offer to somebody who's closer to you and a higher discount to somebody who's further than you, okay? So it's a very simple concept. Change the discount as a function of the distance. It's trivial to do with technology today, um, and we actually did this over the last two years, working with uh, all these brands across 374 cities. And again, redemptions were fabulous. So people understood this idea that there is an economic cost of coming to a store. And so if you're already near the store, it's okay to get a lower discount. Okay? Another force I talk about is crowdedness. Okay? So this is, uh, if you've been to Tokyo, you probably experienced this sort of uh, very unique phenomena. These are professional people pushers. They have a very specific target. Um, you know, that's what the number of people per square meter looks like. One, three, and five. At five, it gets fairly dense. In Tokyo, during peak rush hours, that number goes to 11. So you can only imagine based on this what 11 looks like. Okay? But that's the KPI. So one of the forces that uh, we investigated was how does crowdedness of your context increase your propensity to uh, respond to an offer, a mobile offer? Okay? So again, the simple question is, no matter what brand you are, you know, fast food, retail, cosmetics, banking, et cetera, um, should you send your consumers a message or an offer when the context is less crowded or more crowded? Okay? And you can imagine many such scenarios, uh, whether it's rush hour traffic in a train or a subway or a bus or even an airport, or, or simply just you know, a place like Times Square where there's all, pretty much always crowds. 
And we ran a number of field experiments to investigate this phenomena. We worked with different brands, uh, leveraged the variation in crowdedness across peak hours and off-peak hours across 14 different cities to investigate how does crowdedness affect people's propensity to respond to mobile offers. So here's what we found. Um, as the level of crowdedness increases from one person per square meter to two to three to four to five, the propensity for people to respond positively to mobile offers kept increasing. Okay? So as it gets more crowded, you are more likely to actually redeem offers, whether it's in the form of an ad or a coupon or an email. And it turns out that when we further investigate what was going on, basically the idea is, look, when you are surrounded by all these strangers, right, like you don't know these people in a train or a bus or an airport, what's the first thing that we do? We take our phones out, right? Your phone becomes your escape. It becomes your personal space. Nobody else is distracting you. And that commuting time is a great time for a brand to reach out to you with a targeted offer, okay? So whether it's 20 minutes in a place like, uh, this was done in China in multiple cities, whether it's 20 minutes in China or 30 minutes in the city in New York, um, the commuting time is a great time where not only are, you know, the number of clicks or uh, opening up of emails, higher, but also the actual purchases that people are making on their phones. Okay. Something else that we've looked at is weather. Uh, location data is a great source of what weather is like. And so if I were to ask you, if, if it's sunny versus rainy, right, which of the two days are people more likely to respond to mobile offers? Are people more likely to buy things on the phone when it's sunny or when it's rainy? So how many of you think it's when it's rainy? And the majority of people would think that. It turns out that what we found that is actually when it's sunny, right? So it turns out that the sun biologically has a non-trivial effect on our moods. And so the same people we found are in fact are buying more things on their phones when the weather is actually sunny. It doesn't necessarily mean they're buying fewer things offline. Collectively, the purchases go up. They're buying more things on the phone. They might also be buying more things offline. But it's also true that mobile purchases do not decrease uh, when the weather is actually sunny. Okay, okay so uh, the last force I'll talk about is trajectory. Uh, this is the context of a shopping mall. You see a red dot out there near the Apple store. Okay? So suppose I only had location-based data. And what I would then do is, based on location of this person, I'd say maybe have the Apple store send on an offer. Okay? But therein lies the problem. This person might be standing there, not because he wants to buy something from Apple, but because his friend asked him to wait in front of the Apple store, and then they would go and grab a coffee. Right? This happens to us quite often. Now imagine that if you, instead of just the location data, you knew that this person first went to the Xiaomi store, which is a brand of cell phones uh, very popular in Asia, then the Huawei store, then the Samsung store, then the Oppo store, and finally came to the Apple store. If you knew the trajectory of this person, then you're far more likely of inferring intent. Why is the person standing in front of a certain store and what kind of a brand might be interested in, right? So how are brands getting hold of such data? Uh, it's often through Wi-Fi, right? So when people are uh, you know, browsing on their smartphone uh, on, on a Wi-Fi in a shopping mall or an airport, that gives them access to trajectory data. So, uh, so we ran a number of these randomized field experiments in some pretty large shopping malls across the Asia. Uh, some of them had 300 stores, several million square foot in footage, 100,000 visitors per day, and so on. And it was done in a, it had to be done in a very transparent way so people knew exactly what they were getting into, meaning that if you, were, you know, opt in to share your Wi-Fi data, then uh, you will be getting an offer. And if you don't want to, you can still access the Wi-Fi, but if you don't opt in, then you won't get, be getting the offer. We looked at location-based targeting, random targeting, and trajectory-based targeting. And in all the product categories, and almost every day, we found that trajectory-based targeting is far more useful and far more predictive of what kind of products you might be buying. Okay? So the core idea is actually not that different from what e-commerce companies have been doing over the past you know, one and a half decades or so, right? So Amazon has been trying to predict, like, people who buy this also buy that. People who saw this product also saw that product also saw that product. What we did is we basically took that online recommendation system idea and executed that in the offline world. Okay? So now you have more and more airports. Singapore's Changi Airport is doing this. The um, Emirates Terminal in Dubai is looking into this. Right? 
The moment you're on Wi-Fi, and if you opt in to share your trajectory data, you're going to get uh, uh, these offers. Okay, so one point I do want to uh, mention towards the end is there are some pain points here, okay? Um, and, you know, many of you who are marketers, advertisers, you recognize that we have uh, certain pain points like ad fraud. Okay? So um, there are, I don't know if people, if, if there are people clicking on my ads in the digital space or are these bots, right? So ad fraud is a huge problem across multiple countries. If you worked with media agencies, you know that ad transparency is a big problem, right? So meaning that uh, you know, you're not entirely sure where your media dollars are being spent. Uh, agencies are not able to give you entire color on this. And on the consumer side, we have recognized this problem that there's a very high frequency of targeting, right? Like uh, most of the time is very high frequency and low relevancy. So here's the blockchain can be potentially useful. So we are doing now some work in the Far East with companies in using blockchain to address some of these pain points because of its distributed ledger based system and the smart contract based system, blockchain has the potential to address some of these smart uh, pain points. For example, um, uh, you know, if you're in the ad tech space, right, so you recognize the system is very complex. You've got DSPs, SSPs, trading desk, uh, the ad exchange, the ad network, etc. cetera. Um, so what will happen through blockchain because of the smart contracts is that there's going to be a lot more transparency in the actual transactions that are occurring between these different entities. Okay? Now, there are some caveats which I should also mention. Um, the first is speed. Uh, if you dealt with blockchain, you'd know that uh, on an average, if you look at Ethereum, for example, average Ethereum transaction takes about 15 seconds to be validated because it's distributed. If you look at programmatic marketing, it takes a few milliseconds for an ad transaction to happen. So now you're talking about a disconnect between milliseconds and a few seconds. So the first problem that needs to be solved in the space is reduce that friction, reduce that time gap. Okay? The second is scalability. Programmatic marketing in the, in the US alone engages in billions of transactions every single day uh, by virtue of the fact that Ethereum, which is one of the faster blockchain applications, is still taking us 15 seconds to value the transactions. We are not yet at that scale, um, but it can be done. And the third is complexity. Uh, every single entity in the ad tech ecosystem, from the DSP to the SSP to the agencies to the trading desk to the ad exchanges, they all need to have blockchain installed. Okay? Um, you will see more and more of this happening. Uh, there is a reason, again, why uh, you, know, you could speculate why Facebook's David Marcus, the head of Messenger, was uh, last week transferred into this uh, fairly secretive blockchain project for Facebook. Um, but it's, very, it's, it's a matter of time before the platform companies you know, get into space, along with the telecom providers. Okay. Okay, so to wrap up, basically, uh, you know, hopefully I've given you a sample for some of the work that we've done. Um, like I said, you know, our core goal now is to identify the unknown needs of customers by using AI and machine learning on mobile data. What we're trying to solve is this very high frequency and low relevancy of targeting. Um, and we have some evidence now, and I have a lot of these anecdotes in the book, where we've successfully done this by reducing the number of messages and increasing the relevancy of them. What's really important over the last decade or so that I've you know, done this is brands who are doing this well are the ones who are acting like your butler and concierge, okay? the ones who are building trust and receptivity. And um, it's actually not that difficult. Uh, there are all these details that I've skipped in the interest of time. But there are many, many, many case studies that I have in my book about brands who are doing this well. Uh, there are these nine forces. Like I said, location is powerful, but on its own, it's not as powerful as if you were to add some of the other eight layers on top of that. Okay? I give you some examples of context and crowdedness uh, and trajectory, but there's uh, five other forces. And finally, I'm fairly optimistic that some of the pain points that we have today can be addressed by blockchain, whether it's the media ad transparency problem, whether it's the ad fraud problem, whether it's this issue that consumers face, which is very, very high relevance uh, uh, frequency of targeting. And finally, the last piece, which is how much control will we have in the future over our data? Okay? Uh, this is a fundamental pain point for most of us today that we are the product, right? So if you're not, as you probably heard of this, we are the product of this platform company. So how can we get better control of our data? And just by the fundamental nature of what blockchain actually works on between the smart contracts and the distributed ledger, 
Um, I don't have a time frame, but I'm fairly optimistic that blockchain can resolve some of these issues. It'll give us more access, more control over this transparency problem. Okay, okay I think that was it. Um, so thank you for your attention. I mean, all, all of this data with mobile is, is pretty great, but then how do you control like the, the privacy uh, and maybe better targeting, right? So I mean, there has to be some fine line between, like I, as a consumer, I'm sharing all of this data to yeah. the merchants and advertisers and they're targeting me better, but then at what point, I mean, what, what is the, the boundary for, for that? Sure, yeah, so I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, one of the uh, points that I make in the book are examples of brands who are basically doing a good job in balancing the trade-off. So they are the ones who are acting like your butlers and concierges, meaning that um, based on what you're sharing with them, they are sending back some of those benefits back to you, okay? What you don't want is obviously a brand or company who is crossing that line, becoming a stalker and abusing your data, right? Um, right now, as consumers, we are often at the mercy of the intermediaries, whether it's the platform companies, the telecom companies, the agencies, whatever it is. But the reason why I'm optimistic about blockchain solving this problem is just by the inherent features of the smart contracts, right, and the transparency that it brings. Okay? Like I said, um, there are some caveats there. There's some stumbling you know, roadblocks, the speed and the scale of it. But if you look at the progress that we made over the last two years in reducing the speed of validating transactions in blockchain, uh, and it's, it makes me optimistic that it, it sooner or later we'll have these markets for data privacy, uh, that platform companies will play an important role in negotiating, and where consumers will finally have a say. 